Hi, I'm Alan Smith. As summer gives way to fall and fall to winter, the garden is full of so much bounty and beauty. Join me as we embrace the best that these seasonal changes have to offer. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. In today's show, we're going to take a look at the changing seasons, specifically that important transition from summer to fall and fall to winter. Coming up, we'll speak with organic farmers and learn a little about potatoes. Did you ever think spuds could look so beautiful? And I'll show you why I'm punching the bottoms out of these bushel baskets. And I'll also take you to my Rondell garden, where there's quite a riot of color going on, even late in the season. And we'll take a look at a kid-friendly plant that's sure to get even the youngest gardener excited about growing something. Well, that was certainly the case with me growing up, but you have to stick around for the rest of the story. We'll also answer a viewer question about gardening in extreme situations, something that affects all of us from time to time. But first, we'll travel to the Ozark Mountains for a day on the farm, right after this. Welcome back. If you're like me, you love going to the farmer's market. There's nothing like getting fresh vegetables from the garden. If you have a farmer's market in your city, I highly encourage you to frequent it. And not only do you get a chance to buy delicious fruits and vegetables, but it's a great way to meet interesting people, especially fellow gardeners. That's where I met Rusty and Sue Newfer. You see, the Newfers live in the Ozark Mountains in a community called Jerusalem. They grow up to 23 different varieties of potatoes each year in addition to winter and summer squash and heirloom tomatoes. I stopped by their 80-acre farm to learn more about the potatoes that I frequently buy at the farmer's market. My fascination with potatoes, I guess, is that they're just such a staple. The average working person who wants to get something out of their garden that, that is a staple crop, it's hard to grow the cereal grains, but yet you can always get a crop of potatoes, and if you take a little bit of care, they will make something. Uh, my preferences and tastes in potatoes, uh, I do like to have some flavor there. Um, some whites and some reds are a little bland for me. Uh, the fingerlings in general have a good earthy taste. The rose fin apple is very, very earthy, almost roasted tasting even when it's steamed. We often get a response when people look at our blue potatoes. The variety is called all blue and it's really pretty purple colored. Uh, they think, yeah, we throw potatoes away when they look like that <laughs> because they are a very dark color. Yes. Um, but they're a great baker. They're a great uh, all-round potato, really. For more information on organic farming and interesting potato varieties, check out my website. That's pallensmith.com. Coming up a little later in the show, I'll show you a handy technique for growing potatoes in small spaces. But first, we'll learn something about colorful varieties of plants that I'm experimenting with in my Rondell garden as summer slips into fall. That's after the break, so don't go away. You know, it was my passion for color and my interest in new plant varieties that inspired me to take this part of my garden last spring and transform it into a laboratory for color. I divided the garden into four spaces and created a color theme for each one of them. I have an orange border, I have a burgundy and purple border, I have a mauve and pink border, and then this border is largely made up of blue and purple flowers with accents with variegated foliage. And even this late in the season, you can see the color theme coming through here with this angelonia. All right, we'll get back to this blue and purple border a little later. First, I want to walk over here and show you the orange border and focus on some of the key plants. 
Now, as you can see, the big bold splashes here come from coleus. The more sun they get, the bolder the color. Some of the other plants I've integrated with the coleus include this Tropicana canna, Verbena bonariensis, that's the tall one, I call it Verbena on a stick, Lantana mishuff, and Margarita sweet potato vine. Now, if you shift over here to the burgundy or red border, you can see that this coleus really steals the show. Now I've planted it in combination with this canna black knight, and you can see that the center of the leaf, the color of it here with the coleus is almost a dead match for this wonderful black knight canna. And take a look at the pepper here on the other side of the coleus. You see, I'll go to any length I need to to get the effect I want. This pepper's perfect with the color theme. Now take a look at this grass, purple fountain grass. It's an annual, but what an outstanding contributor to this border. Now just to the other side of the grass, you can see this incredible salvia. It has been blooming all summer long. And next to it is a coleus-like plant called perilla. Now along the front or the base of the border, I've planted pink begonias, this old-fashioned plant called chicken gizzard, and some bright red pintas. Now this is the mauve and pink border, but before I describe it, let's take a look at how this entire garden changes from season to season. In the spring, I fill these beds with lots of tulips, I mean hundreds of them, in full bloom. I really pack them in, and I want you to notice how they stand out against this evergreen background. Okay, now back to the mauve and pink border. Like all the borders we've seen today, I try to start with foliage first. Foliage is so important when delivering great color. And what I've used here is yet another coleus. And I've planted it in combination with a cordyline. These plants work really well together. Now another foliage plant I've used here is this Plectranthus or Cuban oregano. This is the silver variety. Isn't it gorgeous? It's the perfect plant for growing along the edge of the border. And of course, gray foliage plants work with anything. Now we've come full circle and we're back to the blue and purple border. And as you can see, one of the most outstanding plants here is this one called Persian Shield. Just look at the incredible foliage the perfect complement this time of year with this Mexican sage or salvia leucantha. Now I mentioned earlier that I like to grow variegated plants with this color scheme. Three that I used this summer have included variegated miscanthus, the sedge, and Cuban oregano. Now one of the elements I want to point out that helps make this entire space work is this boxwood hedge that makes an oval around the space. It serves as a backdrop for the plants but more importantly, it's a framework for this garden. It gives me visual interest in this space, even in the winter. More from my garden just ahead. I'll share some of the great plants I enjoy drying for autumn arrangements, plus give you some easy tips on growing potatoes in small spaces. So don't go away. Summer shade wouldn't be the same without impatience, and my garden certainly wouldn't be the same without New Guinea impatience. I love them because the petals are striped. You have pink and white contrasted with one another on these big blooms. The New Guinea impatience were introduced in 1989, just that recently. Impatients are a part of a large family of over 500 plant species. One can assume that it got its name Impatience because it's indeed impatient. The slightest touch will cause the ripe seed pods to pop open. And did you know that Impatients are one of the top selling bedding plants in the U.S.? They're just hard to resist. These little charmers are easy to grow provided they're planted in a location that receives filtered light or partial shade. Although today's varieties are more sun tolerant than older varieties, too much sun will cause them to have small, even burned leaves and few blooms.
Have you heard the one about the onion that became a flower? Well, this is no joke. You see, there's a range of ornamental onions called alliums that bloom beautifully from mid-spring to early summer. One of my favorites is this large drumstick allium called Allium giganteum. And as you can see, it's a real show off. It makes a great companion for old fashioned roses like these. I think alliums have such a great look in the garden. I consider them one of the more stylish of the bulbs. You see, I don't plant alliums with the same abundance I plant tulips, for instance, because allium bulbs, well, they're a little more expensive than tulip bulbs. Rather, I punctuate the beds with them. You see, I think they look like big, bold exclamation points. Now, if you live in a part of the country where you have a long, cool spring, allium bulbs are actually perennial. And in fact, they'll multiply over the years. If you begin to see the flowers decline, you may need to divide the bulbs. Now, these large ornamental onions should be planted in the fall, about six inches deep in full sun and well-drained soil. That's very important. In the winter, this bulb needs cold nights with soil temperatures below 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's good to know that most allium bulbs can tolerate 10 below zero. Now you've seen this plant go from bulb to bloom, but what's next for the allium? Well, once they finish flowering, I like to cut them and hang them upside down to use in dried flower arrangements. And yes, they do have a slight onion or garlic aroma when you cut them or bruise them. But don't worry, the smell dissipates quickly and you're left with these striking bundles. So with blooms like these and dried bouquets to follow, it's hard to beat this flowering bulb for adding a bit of excitement to the garden. Now let's take a look at some of the flowers I grow for drying. If you really get into gardening, sooner or later you'll come across the term everlasting. Now that's just a general term for plants that you can cut in the late summer, or early fall, dry, bring indoors and enjoy for years to come. As everlastings go, the straw flower has to be the all-time classic. All you have to do is touch one of these petals to understand how it takes its name. Even before the buds open into flowers, the petals are already dry and crispy, like straw. For most of us, this plant is grown as an annual. You can either plant more mature plants like this directly in the ground, or you can sow it from seed in the spring as soon as the soil begins to warm. Now that we've touched on some of the plants that I enjoy growing and preserving, let's take a look at a simple way to grow potatoes in small spaces. I start by simply taking some half bushel produce baskets and knocking the bottoms out of them. Then I nestle them in loose soil along my picket fence. Then I take a mixture of half soil and half compost and put a little in the bottom and then I place these seed potatoes, two or three in each basket, and cover them up with the soil mix. Now if you try this, you wanna make sure that the seed potatoes you use have at least three to four eyes on them. You see, the more eyes, the more potential for more potatoes. Once planted, in no time, the potato will emerge through the soil, spill over the baskets and bloom, and within four to five months, I'm ready for the harvest. Of course, it'll take this farmer several days to harvest this bounty of potatoes, but with my method, it only takes a few minutes. If you'd like a source on some of these gourmet seed potatoes and other great tasting vegetables, just check out our website. I really enjoy answering a viewer question each week. And today's question comes from Lois in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Now Lois is struggling with a situation that many of us face. She has a small garden under extreme conditions. Lois writes, we live in an apartment and our patio is facing the west. We have shade most of the day until the afternoon. Then we get hot western sun. What kind of flowers can I grow in my flower pots? Well, Lois's question is a good one for anyone who gardens in containers. You see, gardening in containers is like trying to take care of a little island. You have to make sure it has plenty of food and water, especially during the heat of summer. Now, once you have the basics down, it's time to get creative and have a little fun and pick out some great plants. One I enjoy using in containers for both sun and shade are these sun-loving coleus varieties. Take a look at this one, which will spill out of the front of a container. It can take the shade that you're having in the morning and that hot, intense sun in the afternoon. Now, another variety that I like is fan flower. This plant is from Australia. 
Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out one other great performer under these extreme conditions. That's wishbone flower, or terenia. There's so many varieties to choose from. If you'd like other suggestions, just check out my website. That's pallensmith.com. Each week in our newsletter, we post a sampling of questions and my answers. And who knows, like Lois, your question might be used right here on this show. All right, after the break, we're going to take a look at some kid-friendly ways to put some fun into gardening. Certainly fun and children go together. Think back when you were a child. What was the first thing in the garden that captured your imagination? Was it growing your first plant? Or picking flowers with your grandmother? Or going to a local pumpkin patch and picking out just the right pumpkin? Where bigger was always better. Just take a look at this whopper weighing in at almost a thousand pounds. Now another member of the pumpkin family, which is equally delightful, is the gourd. I grew gourds when I was a kid. It was a lot of fun. You see, all you need to grow these is full sun, well-drained soil, and a lot of room because gourd vines are rampant growers. Today, the gourd is pretty useless. No longer do we need them as storage vessels or for tools such as dippers. The gourd is really relegated to the area of delight and fun in the garden. They're meant to be just playful objects. One of the things I like to do with them is just to score them as they're growing with the, with the end of a nail. If you just scratch the skin as the gourd matures, that incision will expand and you can create interesting designs on them. If you really want to get a child interested in the garden, give them a little space they can call their own. I found that raised beds work very well for this. It's fun to have them plant their initials in flowers like marigolds and to grow things that are fun and interesting like herbs and squash and tomatoes. If you want beautiful trees, shrubs and flowers but your last water bill gave you sticker shock, don't punish your plants. Grow with Nutri-Moist Crystals, a biodegradable crystal that helps to hold moisture and nutrients closer to your plant's roots. Mix these granules into potting soil or flower beds. Add water and the granules enlarge, locking moisture into the plant's root zone, which ultimately means less watering for you and more time and money on your hands. Want a more beautiful garden with less work? Learn more about Nutri-Moist Crystals at Nutri-Moist.com. Well, we've certainly covered a lot of ground in today's show, and I've enjoyed spending time with you. I hope you've taken away some new information on potatoes from our visit with the Newfers, and maybe you'll consider growing some of your own potatoes in baskets. I hope you'll also keep in mind some of the great plants I enjoy for extending the seasons, both in the garden and inside the home. Well, that's it for now. Until the next time we're together, remember, just get out there and grow something. From the garden, I'm Alan Smith. In this garden I dream Of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing Of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile Oh, no, I can't help but smile